talk for the uh, brief introduction and uh, thank you for the organizer Dan and Kavita. This is my first in person event after the whole pandemic so I'm very glad to be here in Montreal. And uh, so actually a few weeks ago um, I, I, I asked Dan whether I like the topic has to be strictly related to uh, mean field games or it can be marginal related and Dan replied to me that so far, it seems all the speakers, like their submissions are strictly following the theme. So after some thought, I decided, okay, I'm going to, since this is a mean field game workshop, I'm going to stick to the mean field because I think unilateral deviation is not optimal for me. So uh, as, a, as a price to pay, uh, I have to apologize that this is a pretty much a still like a raw uh, project, like work in progress. So there is uh, still quite a bit of stuff that uh, needs to be done. So anyway, so the, um, the main motivation for this whole thing was uh, I'm kind of interested in um, mean field games or interactions via information, because this is a pretty uh, hot and, and interesting topic so with lots of economic motivations. So economics, for example, recently there's this hot field of uh, something called information design or base and persuasion type of thing. So there are like basically three approaches, approaches that one could try to influence an agent's action, you could either try to provide incentives, incentives to try to, to try to change their preferences, or you could try to improve technologies to try to you know, reduce the cost of them uh, exerting a certain action. And then the third venue is to try to you know, alter the information that, they, uh, that are available to them so that they can uh, choose some action based upon that. Okay, so that actually kind of motivates me to think about, okay, what is a very simple framework that is tractable for me, at least for myself, that uh, at least has some of features of this information uh, interaction and also in the meaningful game setting. And so um, I kind of started looking at, so by the way, this is a joint work with my PhD student, uh, Stephen Campbell. So uh, a lot of the credit goes to him. Okay, so here's the uh, outline of the talk. Uh, so I'm going to start by giving a brief introduction uh, and about the problem formulation. And then uh, I will talk about the uh, single agent problem. And then for the mean field part, actually, the, so far the complete result is that we have the existence of a mean field game solution under certain results. But I'm going to briefly mention something about uniqueness and maybe also about uh, some convergence results uh, in relation to the unfair game. And then uh, I'll present a few, uh, some numerical examples, and then I'll conclude and talk about what's left to be done. All right. Yeah. So I kind of want like a, so we've heard so many nice talks here at this workshops on general theories about convergence, about mean field games, about master equations. And I've learned a lot from that. But personally, as someone who is uh, probably less theoretical compared to many people in the audience, I like concrete examples. I like something that I really understand and I can say a lot of stuff about it. So I'm thinking about, okay, what is the simplest model that has this flavor of in interaction by information and also, uh, at that time, I was working on uh, problems related to optimal stopping. So I want something also involving optimal stopping. So that, that leads me to uh, picking this uh, sequential testing problem that's uh, very well known in statistics. Okay, so it all started from the, um, from the work by uh, Watts and Wolfowitz uh, in 1948 and 1950. So they started looking at this uh, sequential probability ratio test. So you can think of you have um, you have uh, samples coming from some, um, let's say, normal distribution, but with an unknown mean. It could be zero mean, or it could be a mean uh, with uh, mean equal to one. And then you're trying to collect samples to, to decide uh, what, is, uh, what is your prediction about this, uh, this unknown mean. And of course, collecting the samples is costly, so you have to pay a cost of collecting uh, information. And then later, this model was uh, gener uh, generalized to continuous time by Sheryev in uh, 1967. Um, so this is a, a rough setup. So you have uh, two hypotheses. So the null, uh, the null hypothesis is theta equal to zero, and the alternative hypothesis is theta equal to one. And you have a certain prior given by pi and one minus pi. So these agents, uh, so here we're just looking at the classical problem. So there's one single agent who observes this uh, drifted ground motion, okay, with this unknown drift theta. She tries to minimize this uh, Bayes risk, which consists of three parts. So the first part, C tau, this is the cost of collecting samples, okay? And uh, this uh, remaining two terms uh, are the representing like the type one and type two errors. So actually the first term, uh, D equals to zero, theta equal to one, 
this is the, uh, you know, uh, you try, you, you fail to reject a false uh, null hypothesis. So there's like type two error and the last term is like the type one error. So you try to minimize uh, such a criteria and your control consists of a pair where tau is an fx stopping time. So that's to be adapted to this uh, observation filtration. And your D is a zero one valued uh, F tau, uh, Fx tau measurable random variable. Okay, so this is a, some type of partial information. And it's by now it's been standard that one could try to introduce a posterior uh, probability to reduce this to a full information problem. So by introducing this posterior process, high T, which is the probability of theta equal to one condition on Ft, um, then using some standard uh, results uh, from nonlinear filtering theory, uh, one can write an SD for this uh, pi process. We have d pi t equal to mu over sigma pi t times one minus pi t times uh, this uh, W bar process, which is called the innovation. And this is a brown emotion in this uh, FX filtration with respect to your uh, probably measured p pi. So then this whole problem can be reduced to a standard optimal stopping problem. Okay, so just by doing iterative conditioning and utilizing that uh, this uh, decision variable D is Fx tau measurable, just do iterative conditioning, you can rewrite it this way. And then it's pretty obvious what should be the optimal D. Okay, just trying to compare this term with this term and then the optimal D star is given in this way. And then one can write down a free boundary problem for this uh, standard optimal stopping. So this is infinite horizon. And then one can show that the optimal strategy is to stop as soon as this uh, posterior process pi exit a certain strip. And if you exit from the top strip, you try to make decision D equal to one. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna introduce a little bit of uh, interaction in, into this uh, sequential testing problem. So looking at the mean field version and then for simplicity so that we easily have compactness, let's try to look at the finite horizon problem. So here let's let mu theta uh, zero t to be the fraction of agents that have stopped by time t given theta. Okay, and we're gonna, for technical reasons, let's try to work with a regularized version of this fraction of agents that have stopped. So uh, I have this function f mu, which is a mollified version of the input uh, signal uh, mu theta. So here, this phi is a mollifier, but uh, you could also, by picking different forms of phi, for example, to try to uh, make it, let's say, supported on the positive real line, maybe this could also be interpreted as some type of delay of, of, the, of the signals. Uh, so then the agent i here observes a pri private signal xi. So in, a, in the uh, language of, I think, uh, Dan uh, Delarue and Kamona's uh, Dunkran paper, they call it this private monitoring. So each agent is observed having a idiosyncratic noise wi, okay, but the drift part here h not only depends on the unknown uh, random variable theta, but also depends on how many agents in this whole population have already exited by time t, like a regularized version of that is going to enter into the signal process. And then from this observation process, one can similarly define a posterior process pi i, okay, condition on this uh, this uh, uh, signal. So here I write things in bold phase that they can be multidimensional because you have a multidimensional signal. And the objective here is uh, very similar to the classical problem. So agent I is going to minimize its phase risk, consists of a um, cost of collecting the samples together with a loss function. So I'm just getting rid of the decision variable and directly write in terms of some function of pi. And for the classical problem, this G is simply this uh, a, a1 pi minimum A2 times one minus pi. Okay, but for us, actually the prim primary examples we had in mind was to take G to be this uh, cross entropy loss function. So you can really think of this as the cross entropy loss between the true labels, which are the theta, and your predictive labels, which are the pi's. Okay, so you compute the cross entropy loss between these two stuff, you end up getting uh, something like this. So at least this cost function is um, much nicer for us in the sense that uh, it's, it's uh, 
continuously differentiable, at least in the interior. It doesn't have the kink as the classical. Problem. So the main feature here uh, for this model is an interaction via the signal process, or at least uh, this is a special case of interaction by information. And then it also contains a little bit of con common noise, okay, in, in this uh, unknown random variable theta, but in a very simple way. So we kind of thought this is probably the simplest setting that we can look at for optimal stopping problem and with a discrete finite common noise state space. So here, uh, I forgot to add some references here because uh, the slides was already uploaded, but uh, people have looked at um, mean field games with filtering. For example, I think Peter King has a couple of papers on uh, mean field games with filtering uh, date back to, I think, 2019s or, or even earlier. Uh, but mostly, most of those papers are in the uh, control setting rather than uh, optimal stopping. This, you say there, there's common noise here or there's no common noise? There is common noise because the theta is common. It's like a, a population collectively is trying to learn an unknown random variable. Okay. But they don't directly communicate with each other. Okay, so the mu, the mu theta is stochastic just through theta. Yeah, here the common noise is pretty simple. It's just in theta. Okay. And the and the stopping time though can only see xi. It can't. Yeah, see... it's a, it's like a private information. So it can't see mu theta. We can't see how many people have stopped. Well, it, it can. Okay, so here the signal here potentially this is multidimensional. You could, for example, take h to be a vector like the second component just contains f mu as the drift plus some noise. Potentially degenerate noise. Well, that that's a, that's a good point. Like here we have to kind of make things non-degenerate. I mean, it's also, I mean, imagine if noise is zero, you immediately observe the exact fraction of agents have, that have stopped. Imagine the mean field limit, this F mu is kind of like deterministic measure flows condition theta. So if they, if they are well separated, depending on different theta, then as soon as the agents can, can observe what's going on, they know what theta is. So there needs to be a little bit of noise so that they don't have complete knowledge about this unknown stuff. Okay. That's, a, that's a good question, thank you. All right, so um, since this is a mean field game of, of optimal stopping, let me comment on some of the approaches that I, as far as I know, that exist in the literature handling mean field games of optimal stopping. So you either have really explicitly solvable models where you can say a lot of stuff without much other requirement, but those are like, for very specific models, for example, the bank run models of uh, Marcel Nutz, or like Marcel and myself have also uh, have some papers on info games of optimal stopping, but with very particular structures so that you can easily write down an explicit solution. So in the more general setting uh, where explicit solutions are not available, there exists a several notions of a mean field equilibrium. So you could look at strong mean field equilibrium. Um, so this notion was already uh, studied in uh, the bank run paper by Kamona uh, Delarue and, and Lecker in 2017. But for a strong mean field equilibrium, because the requirement of measurability, um, getting the continuity to work is kind of difficult. So I think most people went for a monotonicity based proof, like based on some type of lattice structures, but, and then there you need strategic complementarity to get this uh, monotonicity to work. And if you felt this is too strong a condition, you don't like, uh, you don't necessarily have strategic complementarity. You can try to push for the weak mean field equilibrium territory. And this, for this, you can try to use a continuity based proof. So for the mean field, weak mean field uh, equilibrium, you have to be prepared for some loss of measurability. And I think in the uh, dance like paper, they kind of look at the conditional joint law of the common noise and the, um, and the stopping time. And there recently, uh, I think in year 2020, uh, there also came out another approach with kind of also have a weak flavor. It's a relaxed, relaxed solution approach. So there, instead of looking at the uh, stopping time itself, they try to look at the so-called occupation measure of the state process killed at the stopping time. But it's still relatively like a, like a weak solution approach. And I think in this paper, they didn't even discuss the um, um, construction of an absolute Nash equilibrium type of thing. At least my, my personal takeaway is that I kind of felt like for filtering problem, information structure is very important. In particular, agents don't really see the noise, but only the observation process. So it kind of make more sense 
for people to try to work, um, for example, in the, with the closed loop formulation rather than the open loop stuff. They don't really see the individual WIs, but they only see XIs. Also from the uh, like preference by economists or, or engineers, they like to see uh, like strong mean field equilibrium, like a feedback form, a Markovian form, that's some strategy that they can easily try to implement. So here, what we're trying to do is to work with a strong mean field equilibrium, but without this uh, strategic complementarity uh, assumption in general. So of course, the price to pay is that we really need to work hard on the regularity part. And as we all know that uh, for optimal stopping problems, regularity is much harder to obtain compared to uh, control problems. So far, the main difficulty of this project is shifted to the regularity of the, um, of the single agent problem, as well as like some of the convergence, the continuity stuff in relation to the game. Okay. okay, so here are some of the assumptions that we're gonna make in this talk. So we're gonna write H mu, which depends on T and also this unknown random variable theta uh, to be a shorthand notation of this composition of the uh, fraction of agents that have stopped by time t. So the, uh, the regularity assumption we're gonna make is sigma is invertible. For some reasons, I already kind of explained a, a little bit. And here with our loss of generality, we can simply take it to be identity because otherwise uh, you can simply replace your signal process by sigma inverse times x if necessary to convert to the volatility to be the identity matrix. And the regularity condition on the uh, signal process H, we're gonna assume it's continuous and bounded and it's gonna be jointly uh, C1 in the time and the fraction uh, argument. I mean, some of these conditions is not necessary, could, could be relaxed a little bit. And here we're just, uh, we haven't pushed uh, that hard into getting the like minimum requirement here. And then the third assumption, we're gonna assume there, the signal always contains at least some amount of information. It's non-degenerate in the amount of signals that agents actually see. And there also needs to be some regularity conditions on the uh, payoff function G, I mean the, the loss function G. So we assume G is concave and satisfies G of zero is equal to G of one is equal to zero. And lastly, uh, we assume G is uh, C, C3 with this composition uh, being Lipschitz continuous. So this composition G tilde will show up later in a transformed problem, then you realize why we need this conditions here. Okay, so maybe I should give at least one simple example that satisfy the condition above. So by the way, the cross, law, cross entropy loss function here satisfies our assumption. So then example of H could be of this form. So you have some baseline signal lambda zero, which is the signal that you get without any interaction. And then the fraction of agent stopping is gonna affect the strength of the signals. So here, depending on the sign of lambda one, you could be in the region where you have a war of attrition. So people try to outlast each other. So as time goes on, your signal kind of gets stronger and stronger. So you want to remain in the game. Or if lambda one is negative, you're in the preemption uh, territory. So where the signal gets weaker and weaker. So people trying to leave early. So let me also mention that the C3 regularity assumption on G is not really satisfied by the classical type one and type two error type of payoff. Um, so that's why we kind of moved away from the classical payoff. We really want some regularity on G so that later we can get <coughs> regularity of the whole optimal stopping problems. But here, let me mention that at least for preemption games, this case also works just based on a monotonicity type proof rather than continuity based proof. So finally, let me also mention that one could potentially allow H to depend not just on the fraction of agents who have stopped, but also on their decision groups. Imagine they have this posterior pi, they maybe make certain decisions whether theta is equal to one or equal to zero. And then depending on their decisions, they could also impact the signals in different ways. We, we thought that this should be easy to incorporate. It's just a little bit messy. Uh, in the and also theta may take finitely many values, but we're not so sure if the, the, like the PDE part or the later the regularity part works with a uh, high dimensional. Anyway, let me first define what it does mean to be a solution of this mean field sequential testing game. So let's fix a prior pi. So we say this mu, which is the, uh, a probability measure defined on the time set cross zero one. This is said to be a strong solution to the mean field 
sequential testing gain if tau star is the smallest optimum stopping time for the single agent problem where the mu is input through the drift of the signal process. So that's the optimality part. And then we have the consistency condition that this mu is a fixed point of the mapping, which looks like looks uh, at the conditional law of this optimal stopping time condition on the common noise. Okay, so this is uh, the euro notion of a strong mediate equilibrium to be uh, easy to understand more. Okay, so before we actually move on to the single agent problem, let's take a look at what do we actually need from the single agent problem because just solving a single agent problem itself is pretty straightforward and, and relatively easy. But for the mean field part, we actually need a lot more regularity conditions than just the solving a single agent problem itself. So let's first look at what actually do we need. So let me equip this uh, space with the topology of weak convergence. And the goal here is to show the existence of a fixed point from this uh, product space to itself, which maps this input measure mu, which now because of the common noise is just a two state, so essentially it just becomes two deterministic measure flow. And you try to match it to the conditional law. So to apply Schotter's fixed point theorems, one needs compactness and also continuity. But compactness in this case is trivial because we are working with a finite horizon here. So we don't have to worry about that. And for continuity of this whole regime, I'm gonna decompose it into three steps. So you begin with you know, letting mu n converges to mu uh, in this uh, topology of weak convergence. Then you want to get corresponding convergence of the value functions. And then using that, and together with some other additional results, you want to get the convergence of the corresponding free boundary problems, I mean the free boundaries. And then once you have this free boundaries, you also want to discuss the convergence of the conditional laws of the stopping times with respect to those free boundaries. Because the optimal stopping time is, is, can be defined, can be characterized as the first time that you hit, you exit your continuation region, which, is, which are those free boundaries. So the first step is kind of easy, okay? It's basically like a continuity result of the value function with respect to the volatility coefficient. Because if you look at the, um, okay, I don't have it here, like the um, filtering equation, it's gonna contain like the mu dependence is gonna enter into the volatility coefficients. There's no drift because the filtering process in the martingale, okay? And that one, um, we kinda, you can easily follow uh, some results by Ekstrom um, via a, a time change type of proof to essentially remove the dependence to a, a time change run in motion and then you can get continuity over there. And here actually we want to credit to him for providing some private notes on that result so that there is something that we can cite as we find a little statement in one of his other papers that doesn't have a proof. We kind of write to, wrote to him and he kind of provide this nice private note. So we don't have to prove it uh, in details ourselves. Okay, but the second and the third step really requires knowledge of the stopping problem itself. In particular, the shape of the continuation region as well as the regularity of the value function and or the regularity of the free boundaries. And this is actually the challenging part for optimal stopping problems compared to a control problem, especially the regularity of the free boundaries. Okay, so knowing what we actually need, let's move on to the single agent problem. So let me begin by writing down the filtering equation. Okay, so given a stochastic basis supporting an n-dimensional ground motion, W, and an independent zero one valued random variable theta, we have the observation process now I'm removing the index i so that this is a representative agent. So by standard nonlinear filtering theory, in particular, we have this uh, Kushner uh, Stratton Stratonovich equation. Okay, you can uh, easily get an equation of this form where pi t acting on some function phi is defined as the expectation of phi condition on uh, the observation filtration fx. So if you look at this equation, it's not really closed because it contains pi t of theta, but on the right-hand side, it also contains two other terms, pi t of h times theta, and also pi t of h. Okay, so it's not a self-contained equation all by itself, but that's the nice part about having a finite uh, state space for theta. You could easily rewrite these two terms in terms of 
some linear combination of stuff involving pi t of theta. So everything can be just expressed in terms of a closed system. So here, theta takes two values, so we end up getting a single equation. But if theta takes multiple but finite values, you end up getting a system of estimates, so which are still manageable. So here, W bar is a, a brown emotion in the observation filtration FX. Okay, so just and, and using uh, Levy's characterization, you can replace the dot product, remove the vector, okay, all the driving brown emotions, just replace it by a single brown emotion B here. So that's going to be our, the filtering equation that we're going to work with. And by our assumption on H being bounded and also have some minimum amount of signals, the volatility coefficient is counting the bounded interval. So we have a really nice regular problems that we can try to uh, take advantage of to get some regularity of the value function and the boundaries. All right, so some properties of this uh, posterior process pi. So because we're working with a problem that contains a little bit of common noise, so the matching step has to match the uh, law of the stopping times condition on the common noise. So it makes sense to actually look at the conditional version of the posterior process pi. So here we have a little lemma, the condition on theta equal to one, and theta equal to zero. These are the SDEs satisfied by the pi process. Now, instead of the innovation process, now we have run emotion W that's independent. Secondly, uh, one can also try to show uh, some nice probabilistic properties of this uh, posterior pi. For example, it admits a density with respect to the thick measure. And also, as time goes on, as you collect more and more samples, intuitively you should expect that the posterior estimate is gonna eventually convert to either zero or one, okay, by some type of zero one law. And then actually it does not exit it in finite time. Okay, so you don't really hit the boundaries in finite time, but you hit them at infinity. So things are pretty nice. All right. So we talk about the pi process. And actually for some of the proofs to work, it also, um, it's sometimes nice to work with this log likelihood process instead of the original pi process. So this LT is defined as the logit function acting on pi, the logit function of pi. And you just apply Edo's formula, you can get an SDE for this log likelihood process L. The nice thing about this log likelihood pr process is that if you look at the conditional version, you know, condition on the common noise, they become Gaussian process. So that's another nice thing one can try to take advantage of in uh, proving certain regularities later on, because now you have all the access to the you know, density functions of some hitting times of Gaussian process and things related to that. Okay, so next let me also um, talk a little bit about, about the properties of the value functions, which we're gonna use to later derive the uh, property, the regularities of the free boundaries. Okay, so here, the value function is just defined as this, uh, this way for this uh, simple um, standard optimal stopping problems. So some proposition. First of all, yeah, one can show that this uh, value function is monotone in the volatility coefficient. So here, this eta is where the interaction is going to come in okay, to the filtering equation. So one can show that if eta one is greater or equal to eta two for all t, then the corresponding value function satisfies the reverse inequality. So this is also very intuitive. Like eta represents like the strength of the signal. So you have a stronger signal, you have smaller cost. It's uh, pretty intuitive. And together with the, the third property where you have concavity in pi okay, for any fixed t. So these two, let me mention that the a rigorous proof, I mean, the intuition is clear, but the rigorous proof is really based on an approximation argument. So we kind of took some argument from a paper called Properties of American Options. So we're trying to do like a backward recursive proof of property one and three at a discrete time grid points, and then take limit to recover the properties of the limiting function of it. And for the second property, we can show that the value function is bounded between um, the lower bar and the upper bar, where these uh, function V with the bars are using the lower bound and the upper bound of the um, diffusion coefficient, eta. Okay, so this is like a near consequence of the monotonicity in the volatility. So we just take 
the lower and upper bound of the eta process. So we have yeah, some nice bounds on the value function. And finally, we have this joint continuity of the value function in T n pi. So the last property is a little bit more involving. It basically uses a time and space change. So here, if you look at the photon process, the volatility coefficient has this nice structure that it decouples into the product of a time dependent component and a space dependent component. So in some way, you can try to decouple this time change and space change. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this time and space change. So we have already seen that a space change, which means uh, doing this logic transformation to get to the log likelihood process, this will remove the space dependence of the volatility coefficient. So we end up getting this uh, SDE for L that doesn't contain any pi or any L on the volatility coefficient. And one can further try to remove this time dependence, eta mu of T by a time change. So essentially you try to look at things in the volatility clock so there's a process is at t and define its inverse. And then you introduce this new function LT, which is this log likelihood process, but with time running according to zeta t here. Okay. Then in the time change process, you just end up getting a running motion with unit volatility. So it seems this transformation is nice in the sense that now the state process becomes independent of me. But the thing is really the difficulty or the mu dependence have just been shifted from the state process into the objective function. Okay, it doesn't vanish. It will show up here because of the time change. Okay. So we have this time and space change the problem, which I'm going to call it the V tuta as a function of S and L to be this uh, new optimal stopping problem with this nicer state process, but an uglier uh, looking uh, cost function. And the relation between the original value function and its transform the V tilde is by this time change and also the space change. So here, now you see where this G tilde process comes in. So that's why initially I kind of assumed this composition of G with the inverse of the logit is a Lipschitz function so that I want to get some nice Lipschitz property for this transform the problem. And one can also check that for the cross entropy loss function, all these properties are satisfied. Okay, so G2 that works for the cross entropy loss. So the proof actually for the last bullet point for the joint continuity is via this uh, time and space change problem. So one can easily try to show by probabilistic argument you know, stochastic analysis that this V2 that is jointly continuous and it actually has this bound here on some on compact subsets. So this constant C will depend on the choice of the compact subsets. And then once you have this joint continuity of the V tuta, you can go back to get the corresponding properties. For you. So as I said, the second and the third step also requires some knowledge really about the structure of the problem, particularly the uh, shape of the continuation region so that we can talk about the boundary regularity. So here let's define the continuation region C to be the set of points T and pi where V is less than G. Okay, so this is a pretty standard. And then one can characterize that the smallest optimal stopping time for this uh, single agent problem is the first time that uh, the pair of process exits the continuation region. So, but here, it turned out to be, there's an interesting fact that unlike the classical problem where we have this piecewise linear G, okay, this minimum between the type one and type two error for this cross entropy loss or more be for more general specification of the loss function G, this continuation region may degenerate. And it could be degenerate as a result of equilibrium, not just like something exogenously given. So here, if we define the infinitesimal generator L for this uh, process pi, and look at this set U, which is defined to be the set of points where L acting on the loss function G is strictly less than negative C. And we'll actually have the following characterization of the degeneracy of the continuation region. So one can show that, okay, so these are the T slices. Okay, so these are the unions of the T slices of the continuation region from time T all the way to the terminal time. So we say the continuation region can degenerate from one point onwards if and only if the set U 
degenerates from time t onwards, and each t slices of u is contained in the t slice of c. So actually here, maybe uh, I should show you a picture of what might happen for the cross entropy loss. So here, what I'm plotting is the graph for the generator L acting on G, okay, and at different T slices. So here, maybe for one slice, my eta is 1.1, uh, so I have this curve here. For the other slice, I have 0.8, and this dashed line is my negative C here. So whenever you have this curve crossing this dashed line, this is a slice of the set U, okay? So at this point, the continuation region is non empty. It, it will at least contain this part. But imagine you have a game where the signal gets weaker and weaker as time <laughs> progresses, then this curve might gradually shift up to all the way above the dashed line and stay above the dashed line for all remaining future keys. Then the continuation region is gonna start to generate from that time onwards. Okay, so you actually maybe end up getting a continuation region that closes before terminal horizon. So you have some degeneracy behavior as a result of the equilibrium. So to kind of prevent, uh, that issue. Um, so let me first state the last results here. So suppose U has non-empty convex T slices, and actually it contains the line at pi zero for all T, then the continuation region can be characterized by two boundaries with non-empty interior for all time. So, I mean, this can be relaxed to the situation where it degenerates at one point and state degenerate onwards. But for simplicity, let's assume we're gonna work in this nice case where it stays non-degenerate for all time. So that's the last uh, proposition. Okay, so um, we also have some um, uniform bounds for the free boundary. So I'm gonna make two more assumptions. First one is basically a non-degeneracy condition on the continuation region C. So to try to avoid dealing with empty C, let's for simplicity work with B1, but I mentioned this can be relaxed a little bit. You could uh, allow partial degeneracy, which as the proof gets messier. Okay. The second assumption is a little funnier because it involves the unknown, a priori unknown value function itself. This is a mainly a technical condition that can really be weakened. Here is a pretty strong uh, assumption here. Uh, we haven't really pushed that hard because this is not needed. We only need a very small implication of this result. So I won't come for the sake of time, I won't comment further, but let me just mention that if you have symmetric G, such as the cross entropy loss, then B2 holds automatically. You don't need to check anything for the value function. Everything will follow from uh, symmetry. I just mentioned that this condition can be relaxed. Under these assumptions, um, in particular under B1, B2 is used later, one can show that these free boundaries are actually sandwiched between some constant boundaries. So in particular, the outer boundaries, B lower star and capital B upper star, allows me to never touch zero and one. So for the nice benefit that my cross entropy loss has this shape, which is not really Lipschitz at these two points. And I really want Lipschitz continuity for my regularity assumptions. And having these two fixed boundaries, the little star and the upper star, allows me to not care about these regions. I only need to focus on this part where everything is pretty nice and looks. Okay, and these two, B star, actually comes from the corresponding non-interactive infinite horizon problems using the minimum volatility and the maximum volatility. All right. So under all of these preparation work, we can finally talk a little bit about boundary regularity. So here under assumption B, um, the main result is that the boundaries are gonna be locally Lipschitz. And this Lipschitz constant can be made independent of the input measure mu, which is kind of important for the uh, mean field fixed point continuity. So this is basically an adaptation. It's based on a nice recent results by a paper by Angelus and, and Steve Bach. Uh, it's, a, it's a result about the uh, boundary regularity of some uh, jump diffusion process, I think. So here we're adapting their proof for our time and space change the problem. So the main idea here is that, okay, we're gonna look at the transform problem is the transform the value function to theta and the transform the loss function to theta. So let's split the whole continuation region into two parts. 
because of the uh, nice results uh, from the previous proposition that we can kind of split the whole domain into two parts. So we have a lower boundary, we have an upper boundary. So let's focus on the upper boundary part and call the difference function W plus. So then one can try to treat this free boundary, this upper boundary as the zero level set or the minimum element of the zero level set of this W plus, the W plus. And then if assuming you have like smooth fit, then you can try to try to differentiate this guy with respect to time to get a representation of the boundary derivative in terms of the value function derivative. However, we don't yet know whether smooth fit uh, holds. So what we're gonna do is to step inside of the continuation region to look at the delta level sets instead. So inside the continuation region, the value function can easily to be proved to be C12, you know, just by you can try to do a viscosity characterization and locally work on a parabolic region to upgrade, upgrade the regularity. So everything's gonna be C12. And for this delta level set, you can differentiate with respect to time. So boundary regularity essentially is closely related to regularity of the value functions. We have this representation, then what one can do, although the proof is quite long and technical here, but using some type of differentiable flow of the uh, state process L and some pathwise derivative, one can locally try to bound this uh, derivatives of W plus uniform in delta. So that comes, give us a, uh, a uniform uh, Lipschitz, local Lipschitz constant of all these boundaries. All right, so that's a lot of preparation work for just to get in the uh, uh, needed continuity result of uh, existence of a meaningful game solution. So now let's talk about that. So going back to the previous uh, regime, so what I want to show is that you have weak convergence, then you have this uh, con convergence of the value functions followed by convergence of the boundaries followed by the convergence of the conditional law of the hitting times. So I'll skip the first part. In the second and third part, I'll elaborate a little bit more on the next two slides. So but the main theorem here is that under assumption B, okay, which is the additional assumption on the non-degeneracy of the continuation region and some, some properties about the, uh, the generator acting on the loss function T, one can show that this mean field sequential testing game has a strong solution. For the convergence of the free boundary, so this is where this uh, local uniform Lipschitz part uh, is used the first time. So from this uh, uni local uniform Lipschitz uh, boundaries, you can try to extract a subsequence that converges locally uniformly to some limits, which happens also to be locally uh, Lipschitz. So then, the idea of the proof is basically try to extract a limiting point from the from sequence of boundaries and then try to identify the limit point B bar with the corresponding desired limit P. And then you can try to identify it in two different directions. So one direction is actually relatively easy just by taking limit of this uh, continuous fit equation for the pre-limit boundaries using the continuity or the regularity of the value function together with the regularity of the boundaries, Bn, passing to the limit, you immediately recover that B bar satisfy the continuous fit. And so B bar must lie in the stopping region okay, of, the, of the limiting problem. So you immediately get one direction of the bounds. But the reverse direction is a little bit more involved. So it basically uses the fact that the optimal free boundaries can be characterized as the minimal or respectively maximal continuous solution of an integral equation of all the free boundaries. So I think the derivation of this integral equations requires some irregularity of the boundaries. It has to be bounded variation. And it also uses some smooth fit principle of the value function. So which has to be proved, but I'm, I'm skipping it here. So you need to prove smooth fit, the value function. You need to show that this boundaries have bounded variation and you have this integral equation. So then what we're doing here is that we write down all these integral equations for the pre-limit boundaries, Vn, and then pass to the limit in this integral equations. Then we can show that the limit B bar also satisfy the integral equations. And then because this limiting boundary B is the minimum or maximal, by comparison, we get the reverse inequality. 
finally, we also have the proof of the convergence of the conditional law. But I mentioned it's nice to go to the transform the problem because L condition on theta is Gaussian. So one can try to utilize some existing results about convergence of Gaussian uh, heating times. So in particular, we find this very useful result uh, from a paper in 2004 by Shevchenko. Um, but we have to adapt the proofs because the setups are slightly different. But basically what it's saying, so hopefully it might be a useful result for some other uh, research. If you, are if you are given a sequence of Gaussian processes with converging initial conditions, converging coefficient, and you also have a sequence of boundaries that are locally uniformly converging with some nice regularity. So here in particular, you, you may want them to be locally uniformly Lipschitz. Then you would have the convergence of the corresponding heating times to those boundaries in probability. So then basically we're using these properties to get the corresponding convergence of the conditional loss. So that closes the loop of whole continuity proof. So maybe let me show you a few uh, plots. Okay, so this is what we end up getting for this uh, toy examples of the interaction function H. Uh, this is what the, this is the equilibrium stopping boundaries that we end up getting. So the purple line here is the non-interactive one. So it's the baseline model. And as we gradually increase lambda one, so which means we're moving into the war of attrition regime, the signal is getting stronger and stronger. People will stay longer and longer in the game. So the continuation region kind of widens. And in the other case, when we're moving to the preemption game regime, it's gonna shrink. And here, the, the most negative lambda one that was plotted here is negative zero one. But you can imagine as you continue to decrease this lambda one, the continuation region will degenerate. And at one point, so you have like a very narrow continuation region here, so which means this uh, inter whole interaction might create an endogenous deadline for all the agents, despite that you actually have a capital T, but they never reach that. So you can also try to plot the corresponding CDF for the equilibrium stopping time. So here I only plotted one. So the basically here the shape for conditioning on theta equal to zero and theta equal to one are the same because uh, we're taking a symmetric formulation and we're taking the prior to be one half. So they actually have the same shape. But if you're making the prior different from one half, you would see different pairs of uh, CDF, conditional CDF here. Actually for this game, you, you see a point mass, a direct delta mass at the terminal. So on the right-hand side, this is the equilibrium value of this game where you have the non-interactive case. And then as you gradually increases the strength of the interaction, you are getting more and more accurate in terms of your predictions, your value decreases. So we're trying to minimize loss. So eventually you would imagine this part will gradually go to zero. And on this end, it will gradually approach this dashed line, which is just G evaluated at your prior. That means everybody just stop immediately. There's no point of waiting. You don't get any benefit by observing more samples. All right, so let me quickly wrap up and, and point out some future directions that's still being still ongoing, or at least uh, we plan to do. So what we did so far is we formulated a really simple tractable, uh, tractable mean field game of optimal stopping with features of filtering and very simple common noise. And here tractable, not in the sense that it's explicitly solvable, but in the sense that the optimal stopping problem have nice regularity so that it allows us to work in a strong formulation rather than going to the weak formulation. And one can think of this as a special form of interaction via information, for example, filtration. This is the simplest way I can think about where it, it, different agents have different uh, filtrations that are slightly different from each other. And under some suitable conditions, we establish the existence of a strong mean field equilibrium. So some directions for further investigation or some ongoing work. Um, so currently we're working on um, getting closed loop epsilon Nash equilibrium property. So this, this has been challenging. So this morning we have uh, heard this very nice talk on getting closed loop uh, epsilon Nash equilibrium for mean field games of controls. So here at mean field games of optimal stopping has a little bit of flavor of mean field games of controls. So eerily like having open loop uh, epsilon Nash equilibrium is much easier than closed loop, but we kind of felt like for filtering problems since the noise is not really observed, it's more natural or 
um, more implementable for people to actually go for closed loop thing. But then it's much more challenging um, to, apply, to apply, for example, ground wall type of estimate for the propagation of chaos because of the stopping problem feature that you really need. It's, it's, it's hard to translate some error estimates in terms of the stopping time into the PI process so that you can complete the loop of ground wall estimates. So we're, we're currently still working on this part. We have some ideas, but we're not done yet. And some other uh, directions to generalize is this part is relatively easy. One can easily incorporate decision rules to the signal. But for multi-hypothesis uh, testing, writing down a filtering equation, there's no problem. It's just a coupled uh, SDE system, finite dimensional. But for the strong formulation, one needs a lot of regularity for the continuation regions, for the value functions, and the free boundaries. And if the free boundary is something, some curves in the hyperdimensional space, we're not sure yet how feasible uh, that part is. So in that sense, to further generalize such a problem, one might be tempting to go with weak formulation, but then there's the question of how do we kind of ensure the information structure is correct for filtering problem? For example, in particular, I'm not really sure given a weak mean field game solution, how does one construct a absolute Nash equilibrium that's adapted to the observation filtration? not just the noise. So that's a, that's a question I don't know the answer yet. I might uh, go back and while we watch the first talk in the morning and see if I could get some inspiration. Um, and in, along the same uh, lines, one could also look at a continuous state space for the common noise rather than discrete. A very simple uh, problem that's really closely related to the sequential testing is the quickest detection problem. So instead of having a zero one random unknown random variable they are trying to detect, you have a random time that comes into the drift. So at some random time before the time, the drift is zero, at that time, the drift jumps to one. So you want to figure out what's the, what's, what, what's, you want to make a quickest detection of this uh, disorder time. So that's being a random variable defined on the non-negative real line. It has a non-continuous state space. So if you write, try to write down the filtering equation, it's not gonna have a finite dimensional representation. So the problem there is already uh, pretty challenging. And finally, one could also think about what about more general models for information interaction, which I meant interaction via filter of interaction, maybe not necessarily just generated by a simple signal process. Okay, so I guess because I'm running out of time, let me just uh, stop here and uh, thank you very much. I thought about uh, uniqueness questions for your equilibrium. Oh, you, yes, yes, I, I forgot to list. So I'm relatively confident that we could potentially get to uniqueness for small horizons, but uh, uh, by, by a contraction type of uh, argument, but for arbitrary horizons, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, but the closer loop, if mm -hmm. just consider the information state, mm -hmm. uh, you treat it as uh, the state uh, variable. You mean the, the pi? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, can you just reduce it to uh, I stand a problem with a complete state information? So well, well you, if we're working with the pi process, yeah, it's, just it, it's like, a, yeah. Pi the I mean, one can, one can easily propose candidates for this uh, closed loop absolute Nash equilibrium, but they just, in terms of getting that optimality property, yeah. it's a little hard. For example, um, one an, an obvious candidate here is you take the mean field continuation, like the boundaries, and then just find the uh, stopping strategy for the n player game as the first time their own pi n process, like the, inter the, the n player pi process hits their the mean field boundaries. That would obviously be like a closed loop type of thing. Uh, yeah, maybe you can try to rewrite the cost, rewrite the cost also just in terms of the information state. You mean pi, but I think yeah. currently... Reduce it to a, a, not a new problem with a complete state information. I think currently it was written in... Isn't, isn't this like a complete information? Now? Yes, you just regard the pi as the state. In state. So maybe it's... Uh, yeah, in the end, the stopping time, stopping time is also based on the information state. Right, 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 right. Yes, yes. I mean, solving the, the mean field game, it wasn't that much of an issue. It's just going back to the M player game. You don't actually have this conditional IID because of the randomness coming from uh, I mean, sampling. For, that... for estimate, if it's a Nash, maybe there's some hope. 
Yeah, I mean, we're, we're currently working on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Another question is uh, mm -hmm. about the information. Mm -hmm. uh, in your model, mm -hmm. uh, the percentage function uh, f mm -hmm. is uh, encoded in the dynamics. Yeah, if it's met the public, you mean the a, a percentage public, uh, of uh, players who uh, have a stop is uh, is the F function. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's uh, used in the diffusion dynamics, but physically it's uh, more reasonable to consider. You have the measurement process, then the behavior of the agents is just uh, alone. Uh, I mean, you you know uh, the percentage function. You mean you do directly observe yeah. F? Yeah. Yeah, I think share the information. I think originally we thought about that formulation, but uh, for example, for some reasons, I'm, I I kind of commented on Ben's question earlier that if you directly observe this f, it's kind of you you already know what theta is because the the mean field limit, mm -hmm. like if based on diff, condition on different theta, the f is well separated. Then just knowing a little bit of what the f is, you can already know what the theta is because different theta leads to very different f. So if you have that information available um, to the agents, you kind of know what theta is. You can infer back. So you need a little bit of noise so that you don't you don't get you know degenerate uh, situation. Or, or, or maybe I didn't yeah, quite okay. get to your question. We can talk a little bit offline. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Thank you for your very nice talk. Um, I have a question at the intuition level when these barriers come together. So my question is like, if enough, if it comes too fast and that a lot of people quit, mm -hmm. then maybe the people still in the game does not have a, a lot of other people to explore, um, to get the belief of what the true variable is. So is, is, this a, is there an effect on this type of situation? Like you are not yet at the infinite limit and the finite game, too many people have gone out and the sample of other people that you are reading this fraction is smaller and smaller. Does this create some problem somewhere or not at all? You mean problem in, in, in what sense? Like the continuous region degenerates to a point? That, yes. that, that, that might occur in this game, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we have actually have another plot, which I didn't show here, which it degenerates, like it run the numerics, it just closed. Okay, so in this situation, is it like easy now to compute my cost again? because to compute I'm, the cost yes or, or maybe i misunderstood like this filtration that i'm using the other people observation to understand mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to get an idea on the signal it basically just means everybody have already stopped by that point yes so so actually maybe let me mention that you don't in the, in that case you don't actually see an atom at the terminal time it's still like a, a, a distribution with a density, just have a very concentrated at that point. So maybe your stopping time kind of converges to a point at here, but like you don't see an atom at this point, at this T0 in the corresponding equilibrium CDF. Means like everybody have already stopped by that point. There is nobody who's left in the game or if they're left in the game, maybe they're gonna force to stop or it's optimal for, the, for them to stop at that point as well. There's no more benefit of waiting. Just, just a very quick follow-up mm -hmm. to that. So these, you're saying about, in, in for a small lambda, this kind of collapses and there's this endogenous deadline and what mm -hmm. you just described here, is mm -hmm. this based on numerical evidence or is this something you've, you've proven? Oh, uh, so far it's based on numerical evidence. I mean, we, one can easily um, prove that uh, if you set like a generator acting on G satisfies certain properties, the continuation region must, uh, you know, degenerate at some point, mm. but we haven't really given rigorous proof in terms of existence of a mean field game solution in the degenerate setting. But we believe it's it's doable. Just like uh, all the analysis has to be adapted, adjusted mm. to accommodate for that. But like the picture I show, that was a numerical example. And my student uh, happened to run with a very negative lambda, and he just observed that behavior. It, it causes numerical. Okay, I'm curious. Uh, very interesting point. Thank you. Any question online? Questions? So thank you again. Thank you.